welcome to Season 5, Episode 193 of School Librarians United. I'm your host, Amy Herman. This podcast is dedicated to the issues and challenges school librarians face every day. As a school librarian in my 16th year, I knew I wanted a podcast which addressed the nuts and bolts of running a successful library program. I don't claim to have the answers, but I hope that this is a platform to share resources and exchange ideas. Now is a perfect time to mention that all the ideas and opinions expressed in this podcast by myself, my interview guests, and listeners who reach out to the podcast are our own and do not reflect those of our school districts. When incorporating research, I always make sure to cite my sources. So whether you are a novice or a veteran school librarian, this podcast has something for you. I wanted to give a very special shout out to Amanda in California, who is using Capstone's discount code to order some books this year. She wrote, I'm in an elementary school and recently found your site. It is such a treasure. I listen to the podcast when students aren't in the library. I have passed it on to other librarians as well. Listeners have let me know that over the years, they have found jobs which lend themselves very nicely to listening to podcasts while they work. This includes shelving and checking books in, as well as weeding. I'd also like to give a shout out to Andrea in Illinois and Michelle in Utah. I welcome you and all listeners to reach out with your feedback and episode suggestions. You can reach me either on Facebook, on Twitter, my handle is at LMS underscore United, or the email address schoollibrariansunited at gmail.com. If you include your mailing address, I'll be sure to send you a podcast sticker. And now a word from our official sponsor, Capstone. Capstone is an innovative publisher and education technology provider of children's content for school libraries, classrooms, and at-home learning. Home of the award-winning Pebble Go Research Database, Capstone has a passion for creating inspired learning and intellectual curiosity in children, and I'm so excited to be working with them. And now in a segment I like to call Why I Love Capstone, I want to make sure that everybody knows about National Hispanic Heritage Month resources, which Capstone has conveniently curated into a single web page. And friends, I've included a link in our show notes. Be sure to check this out because they have done a wonderful job of compiling all of their both print and digital resources in one place where you can take a look. And I want to read from the website for just a minute. National Hispanic Heritage Month is celebrated from September 15th to October 15th and honors histories, traditions, diverse cultures, and contributions of Hispanic and Latin Americans. September 15th is also an important date in the history of many Latin American countries, and it is when they declared independence from Spain in 1821. Did you know that the Hispanic population in the United States is more than 62 million people? This vibrant community includes 21 Spanish-speaking countries and territories and is the largest ethnic group in the United States. And friends, this is where Capstone really does its homework because what they've done is created sort of a one-stop shop. They included resources from outside of their of their databases, including those from the uh, Library of Congress as well as the National Park Service. Capstone then features three authors, Keiko Novales, Alicia Salazar, and Alex Sanchez, and their books, which all have central characters who are Latino. I love whenever Capstone provides free downloadables for anybody to use, including bookmarks, coloring sheets, inspired recipes, and word search. And I want to make sure to draw attention to how Pebble Go gets in on the action here. I found this incredibly valuable, especially for anybody who's contemplating investing in Pebble Go, because they've provided content maps of the articles which they have in Spanish for animals, as well as science and social studies and health, as well as biographies. And all of these are written in Spanish. And it, it's fantastic because it's a very comprehensive list of, of hundreds and hundreds of different articles all written in Spanish. This would be a fantastic resource, not only for those of us whose school communities support large populations of Spanish-speaking students, but also for those of us whose students are learning how to speak Spanish. And finally, Capstone has provided a Hispanic Heritage Month shopping guide full of books which are organized both fiction and nonfiction. You've got reading levels from kindergarten all the way to sixth grade. And these books include biographies, folklore, graphic nonfiction, as well as informational text, realistic fiction, and sports fiction. 
I am so grateful to Capstone for their continued commitment to support the podcast in Season 5. They are offering listeners of School Librarians United a very special discount. Visit shop.capstonepub.com and use the code UNITED to get $20 off an order of $100 or more for both print and Capstone Interactive eBooks. That's code UNITED for $20 off an order of $100 or more for both print and eBooks on shop.capstonepub.com. And now for our episode, Teaching Media Awareness and my conversation with Jamie Gregory. Friends, I am so excited. Jamie Gregory, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. I'm so excited to be here. Friends, before we get started, you know, Jamie, I'd love to congratulate you. You are one of Library Journal's Movers and Shakers for 2022. The first time I learned about you, I was turning the pages of of the magazine, and I saw you there, one of uh, six school librarians being featured for the contributions of this past year. You were called a media mentor. I was so excited to see that. I really couldn't believe it either. Um, There's just so many, so many amazing school librarians doing so much today. Um, I can't imagine how difficult the task is to pick only a handful of winners. So just so, so excited, so honored. Well, and I think, friends, it's going to be apparent, readily apparent at the end, by the end of this conversation, that Jamie is incredibly well-deserving of this uh, accolade. So, Jamie, would you first give us some context? Tell us where in the country you work. Give us an idea about your, your library, the grades you support, the programs that you offer, and some of the things that you do that make your program and, and your uh, library special. Sure. So I am teaching in the upstate region of South Carolina. Uh, If you've heard of Clemson University, I'm sure you have. I'm not far from Clemson. Um, So I'm in Greenville and I live in the Spartanburg area and they're pretty close to each other. Um, So this is my 18th year in education. This is actually my 10th year as a school librarian. Um, My first eight years, I was a classroom English teacher. And I am currently in my third year at an independent school in Greenville, South Carolina. So I'm at Christ Church Episcopal School and I'm in the upper school. So that's grades nine through 12. Uh, We have about 450 students in the upper school. Um, So I'm the upper school librarian and I am also the journalism newspaper teacher, which is an elective that students can take and they get an elective, they earn an elective credit for that. And the, the class is all year long. We actually started a group last year that we named the Ida B. Wells Society. And so those students in that club are dedicated to social justice and social change. And they sought me out as one of their advisors when they wanted to start this club. And one of the things that we're working on is getting a, we have an honor council at my, our school. We have an honor code. They want a diversity council, something kind of similar. So we're looking at that. We're looking at trying to help the school plan programming for different events related to diversity around campus. They want to start a mentoring program with students from the lower school. Um, So that's busy. We have a book club that's just like your standard book club in a school. Um, I also started a club called Lit, the library influencers team. I was trying to be cool. (laughs) I don't know. Um, Or just for students to like help me plan contests in the library and if they think the furniture should be rearranged or, you know, what books should I buy next? Whatever. They can be part of that. And this year, I am actually also the senior capstone coordinator for the for the upper school. And so we used to call it senior thesis. And so every senior who is not in our IB program has to participate in senior capstone, which is basically like a senior research project. So I'm, I'm coordinating all of that. Um, and I like to do a lot of stuff that obviously centers around literacy, but also tends to incorporate media and news literacy as well. So um, every year at some point in the year, um, usually in September, because it's banned books week, I call it the freedom to read. And our 11th grade dean asks me to put together a digital escape room that all the 11th graders take part in during our homeroom period. And so they have to, again, use media and news literacy skills in the, you know, gamification, having fun, but learning about book censorship. January is News Literacy Week, sponsored by the News Literacy Project. And so I had ninth graders complete a little news literacy activity last year during that time, during their homerooms. Um, And I was even able to, I collaborated with our middle school librarian, who's amazing, Brenda Stevens. We did a couple of parent programs last year. 
about media literacy and news literacy. So kind of like we did some activities with the parents that we had done with the students during these homeroom periods and classes and different things. So we were able to do that too. So that's like a brief snapshot. You know, I, I love what I'm, the wonderful thing that I hear is that you are able to teach your students and it sounds like you're doing it remotely, that you're feeding lessons through the, the homeroom times when students are gathered in a grade specific uh, yes. class. How long is homeroom? This year, it's a half an hour twice a week. But lucky us, during COVID year 2020, 2021, we were still in person because we're so small. Uh, we were able to make that work safely. We just because of how we had our schedule, we had that homeroom for two hours, which now like we just it's like we don't talk about Bruno. We don't talk about that. <laughs> it was painful for everybody. Trust me. So, you know, I was trying to help out um, the people planning like, oh, my gosh, what can we help these teachers do during this time? And so I just tried to help throughout the year like, oh, I can create this digital escape room. Oh, I could create this hyperdoc that students could do or whatever. So that's, that's kind of where the idea came from. And we just still do them. Well, and I, I think it's interesting because for those of us on a flexible schedule where we don't have a, a, a schedule of students coming in every single class period, trying to, to access all of our certain, our grade levels in a way that is, is fair and in a way that is expedient. Um, if I were trying to reach every ninth grader in my building, it might take me three weeks because of when their classes meet. And absolutely. And it sounds like you are, are you sharing these lessons with their advisory teachers and then their advisory teachers are implementing them? So you are working through the advisory teachers to provide this content. That's exactly right. Um, we have we use a Google Doc system that shares the that day's um, homeroom plans with the advisory teachers. Um, and I myself had my own advisory group. Um, and so I helped lead my own student through it. Yeah, so they I would give them everything once in a while. I would make a video of myself showing them what to do if I thought it was maybe a little more involved. And, you know, they're so busy. They don't always have time to really look at everything beforehand. Um, so yeah, yeah, that's, that's, that's it. Wow. And I, I know that those homeroom teachers or the advisory teachers, depending on the, the terminology that you use in your school, I, are grateful because you're creating content and it sort of gets everybody else off the hook. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, I know when we rolled our, our one-to-one initiative, uh, they, they tagged me and said, we need you to, to record something that we can have broadcasting to the entire school. And, and it was, it was a, a very surreal experience to be teaching all 1,300 of my students at the same time. And, uh, and got some kudos. But again, you are still raising the profile of what we do, albeit we're, we're pushing that through in through their advisories and, and making that time more and more relevant yes. to to learning. Yeah. As a, you know, the, the whole learning process, we're, you know, I, I love that. That's wonderful. That's exactly right. And I, you know, when I, when I planned the ninth grade activity last year, that when they did the news literacy activity, during News Literacy Week, I had just gone to the ninth grade dean um, and said, hey, do you need any help planning stuff? And she was like, absolutely. What do you want to do? So all I had to do was go ask her. When we take on the the to-do list of our administrators, <laughs> I, I know we're, we're winning uh, fans. We're winning right. fans. When you make your administrators problems your problems. Well, and it is, I mean... It is kind of self-serving, Just a little bit. <laughs> but of course, of course, it's still, it benefits the students. Like you said, it gets them interested and it's a great block of time that has to be there. So why not support the school library? Absolutely. I love that. I, I'm, I'm stealing that idea. <laughs> hey. <laughs> You are the first guest to be on the show who blogs for ALA's Office of Intellectual Freedom. And friends, I've included a link in the show to, I believe it's all of the blog posts you've written for them. That's right. Clearly you enjoy writing. It, it is, it is a, a strength of yours. You know, I have to imagine that these days there is no shortage of topics to write on for the uh, Office of Intellectual Freedom. Well, gee, I don't know why you say that. <laughs> <laughs> I I just I want I don't you know to, what you mean. 
Yes. Well, let listeners know, let's give us an idea of the kinds of things that you have, you know, decided to, to just dig deep on, because for me, this would keep me occupied for a very long time, reading all of the different articles that you've read. And, and I really think that listeners would find this an incredibly helpful resource, especially during this time. But would you share with us some of the things that you have given focus to because uh, it's so incredibly relevant today? Sure. Yeah, absolutely. So I started blogging in January 2019. And I actually did kind of go through a period where I thought, well, you know, I'm supposed to submit a blog post once a month. I, I hope I don't ever have trouble, you know, finding things to write. I mean, I don't think I thought it in that many words, but yeah, that was bad. Um, so, but there really, even before everything exploded the past year or two, there really was unfortunately no shortage. Um, one of the first things I wrote about was how, I think it was in 2014, um, the college board was revising the AP US history standards for their course. And they go through these revisions and they come out and these um, political groups, right wing groups complained about them, basically. And I'm making a long story short, but basically the College Board went back and revised them again. And if you look at the wording, you it's very obvious how, you know, the, the standards themselves are showing some bias in the wording. Um, and I also have written about our South Carolina state U.S. history standards. It's kind of the same story. So when you look at our South Carolina United States history standards, for example, it does you won't see the word slavery mentioned at all. Um, at one point, it mentions the plantation economy. Um, they use the phrase marginalized people. Um, and so you can see some bias there. And I know that those public school teachers, they also have an end of course exam. The, the state administers to these students. So they have to prepare these students for this exam. So they're like, you know, I can only teach to these standards. There's no time. You know, I'm going to be held accountable for these test scores. So anyway, you know, looking at how your education standards might be problematic is important as a school librarian, because you're going to be looking at those standards anyway to try to provide support for teachers. So that's one way to look for censorship that maybe some people don't think about right away. Um, I also looked at in South Carolina, our health education laws. Because at one point until recently, um, it was written in our laws that you could not talk about anything other than heterosexuality unless you were talking about STIs. And that's disinformation. You know, that does not serve our young people um, withholding information that could put them in harm's way. And obviously that also discriminates unjustly against an entire group of people. So looking at that, that that's the type of censorship that maybe we become more aware of, but haven't always in the past. I have written about um, censorship at book fairs. Sometimes on some partisan blogs, you'll find complaints about, you know, what books are showing up on the cover of the Scholastic Book Fair flyer that kids come home with, that kind of stuff. I also wrote a piece when We Are Water Protectors won the Caldecott. I was seeing some librarians post in some Facebook groups I'm part of that they weren't going to buy that book because it was too political, quote unquote. And I, it's a beautiful book. I've read the book. Um, it, I think it's a great way to open a lot of discussion. And so I wrote a piece about that, um, that, you know, you keeping that book from children uh, is not going to solve any problems for you. It, you're taking away a, a perfectly legitimate learning opportunity and you reading that book to them isn't making them believe anything. It's making them think broadly about a topic, about an issue. It opens the door for further research. And you're not telling them how they have to think about something. Um, so that was interesting to see, um, for sure. And I also got to interview um, over email Ruta Sapetis when her book, The Fountains of Silence, came out. And um, that was just fantastic since... Um, Kind of her theme and her pattern as a writer, as you know, um, is hidden histories. And so we talked a little bit about how hiding stories from history affects the future and how we study history. And of course, that couldn't be more relevant now. Um, so those are some definite highlights. Um, I also got, um, before she passed away, Karen Blumenthal 
Um, I was going to interview her and then she passed away. I believe she had a heart attack. This was maybe a couple years ago when her book Jane Against the World came out, which is about the history of birth control rights and the right to privacy in our country. And we emailed a little bit back and forth. So I was able to write the post. Um, and so that was incredible, too. So, yeah, I I have always loved to write. Um, and so it's been an incredible, incredible opportunity to write for OIF. Well, and I, I appreciate that because, you know, oftentimes I, when I talk to, to listeners, they're sort of like, you know, I really just like to read. I really just like to read. Couldn't you just put your podcast out <laughs> in, you know, I just want to read it as a blog post. I'm like, there are so many amazing people who write out there. That is who you should, you should be reading. So friends, definitely, if you are looking for, for ways to fill your, your, your 20 minutes at lunch and reading these incredibly, you know, articulate and well-written uh, pieces on on you know media awareness and you know in terms of this you're talking about contentious issues which we don't do our our students any service by shying away from um, the more we can educate ourselves about how we should move forward the more likely we are to be able to address issues when when we are confronted with objections objections raised by the community objections or even you know I, I'll be honest uh, questions being raised by our staff members you know who are who are who are curious as to what our agenda is as as educators what angle we're doing and uh, i know i'm going to ask you this and i'm just sort of it is interesting to me how one teaches media awareness in a way that is never perceived as partisan because it it is as educators i think it is so easy for people to try to, you know, point out some, some nefarious agenda that, that educators have. And I, I, I really object and I, it's very frustrating. So I love that you've written on so many of these topics and given us some of that, I don't want to say ammunition, but just a, a a better appreciation of the topic overall. In 2021, you received the National Association for Media Literacy Education Teacher Award. I know this organization might ring a bell for some listeners, but for others, I, I, you know, please, would you give us some context? Why should librarians know about this organization? I believe it's pronounced namely. Yeah, that's right. Um, so this is, uh, and there are so many great organizations out there that support media literacy, um, but Namely provides so many resources. I was just on the website today looking for something and I got lost. There's, in a good way, there because there's so much there for different grade levels. Um, so it's free to become a member. So look that up and become a member of Namely. They have, um, their concert conference has been virtual the past couple of years, and they have had the most amazing sessions for their virtual conference. Um, so you, you just, you don't need to reinvent the wheel. If you feel like you want to get started and you want to incorporate media literacy more, but you're just not sure how, or, or you're worried about being perceived in a, in a bad way in the community or whatever, just check out the website and see what resources they have, because what you'll see is it's not contentious. It's not controversial to do the things we need to do in our classrooms. Um, and also Media Literacy Week is coming up at the end of October and they have a great student contest. They have a theme for each day of the week with resources and links and articles and, and, and everything. So um, definitely check that out. they include incredible topics like race and equity and social justice. Uh, I, I don't know if people are necessarily aware of just how broad the, when, when namely provides these kinds of resources, they include gender and sexual identity. They include race and ethnicity and social justice. And of so many of these topics we can address. I always feel good about sharing resources out which have been curated by librarians. And this resource in particular is well-established and it is incredibly in-depth and, and it provides our teachers with uh, additional information that they can use in their classrooms. I feel confident whenever I put resources and push them out that, that guests like yourself have been sharing with us. So I appreciate you doing that. Friends, uh, on that uh, same note, make sure that you spend some time in uh, taking a look at Jamie's show notes because uh, it, it 
honestly, it's sort of like a treasure chest. I open up our show notes and I start to scroll and realize that somebody else has been in here and has been embedding these amazing resources in receiving this Literacy Education Teacher Award. Can you share with us what was it about your particular program that caught the eye of the award committee? Well, that's interesting because I was in a cohort of teachers and librarians in my state who were kind of working together at the same time to earn the PBS Media Literacy Educator certification that Tamara Cox was leading. Um, And so it's kind of toward the end of the cohort, like March or something like that of 2021. And she says, I want to nominate you for this award. And I'm like, why? I don't, you know, because I just didn't think I was really doing anything that was unusual or extraordinary or anything like that. And she said, no, I want to nominate you. So, you know, Make a list. I know some of what you do, but make a list of everything you do that you think would be relevant. And I tell you, that was an amazing exercise because I got to see, wow, I really have accomplished a lot and done a lot in this area. Um, And it's it's okay to be confident in my work and my accomplishments. And so um, when I was making that list, um, I just I was remembering things that I had even forgotten about that I had done. Um, so even back when I was a classroom teacher in my AP language class, uh, we would do a documentary analysis project, analyzing how documentaries were produced, the arguments they made, the evidence they used, and that kind of thing. Um, I also did an advertisement analysis project in AP language. Um, I've given a lot of different um, workshops and professional development opportunities to teachers over the years that incorporated media and news literacy skills in them. Um, I've written several articles published in Teacher Librarian that address various aspects of media and news literacy. Um, One of my favorite projects was when a social, a U.S. history teacher, she wanted to kind of spice up her progressive era unit, and in particular, the state standards about uh, labor unions and strikes. So they came in and we did stations and I had song lyrics and political cartoons and pictures and all that kind of typical stuff. But Just through some lucky circumstances, um, a documentary about labor strike, union strikes in 1934 was playing at my local library and I caught my eye. I'm like, oh, you got to be kidding me. That's crazy timing. That's what we're going to do in my library. So I go to a screening of it and then I learned I'm in an area of South Carolina that has a heavy history of the mill industry that, of course, has died off. And so then... Attending that event at the local public library, I learned that that documentary had been censored in this state, even in the early 90s, because if you know, I don't know if you would know the name Roger Milliken, but he basically owned the whole town, the whole area in in the mill industry and um, that kind of thing. So he didn't want the information in the documentary to come out because it would make certain people in power look bad. And so I was able to incorporate that into the station work, which was incredible. So that also incorporated censorship, media literacy, and news literacy. And then I even found a guy who had written a memoir about one of the strikes that was in the documentary. And he had grown up in my area. And he had found out when he became an adult that his grandfather was the mill superintendent when some people were shot and killed during a strike. So, and then I contacted him and he, we Skyped with him. And so just the incredible learning opportunity that was for these students. Um, And so remembering that experience was really powerful for me to, to remember like, wow, as a school librarian, I was able to put all of that together just because of the position I have in the school. And it just, if you didn't love school libraries, you really should. (laughs) Because it was awesome. Well, and I love when you listening to this, how all of this came together, the commonality is you. You're, you're, you're sort of, you're sort of the, the, the spoke of the wheel because all of these things are coming in from all different, uh, sources and you are the point person that sort of connects everything together and brings it and gift wraps it for your, for your class and for your, your, your teachers. And you're right. It is because we're in a unique position. When people say, oh, wow, you're so resourceful, 
to limit that to just the books that we offer, the print resources, the digital resources. Right. But what you've done is beyond that. And you're talking about and human resources. You're, yeah. you're talking about those connections, those connections that you have made in the community and the larger group, the larger community outside of the immediacy of your school and being able to draw upon that and bring that and host that opportunity for your students to all benefit. I, I, your teachers must absolutely love you. Well, I, that was super fun for me. I'm also a history junkie anyway. Um, and so I just couldn't believe that all that happened and came together like that. Um, and yeah, cause, and I remember being a classroom teacher myself, I wouldn't have had time for that. So, you know, I enjoy being that person in the building because I know how the classroom teachers feel. Um, and it's just a great opportunity. I think it's so important because we have to see these opportunities and seize them. Yes. We have to see the opportunities and then and then latch on to them and, and harness that. And so we can can provide those opportunities to our students and to our teachers. You know, Library Journal's Movers and Shaker Award recognizes the work you've done to promote media awareness in your school. You are a media mentor. And when it comes to promoting media awareness, do you feel that you are being reactive or proactive in this in this effort? I feel like I definitely started out being proactive because you know, I, it's my personal feeling and experience. I started as a school librarian in 2013, that we were not living in the same kind of climate that we are now in terms of polarization, book censorship, all that kind of stuff. Um, so, you know, I definitely think the first several years, it was proactive and just making sure that students were in, and some of it was an equity issue, right? So making sure that when students came to the library to learn that, I was equitable in how I was selecting the types of resources. So is there a variety of print materials on different reading levels? Do I have images for visual learners and sound for audio learners and all that kind of stuff? Um, but I mean, I definitely, I, I don't know, honestly, that I would have thought about having a parent's night for news literacy back in the day. <laughs> what I'm saying is back in the day, you know, uh, before 2016, 2020, something like that. Um, so it's de it, it is definitely morphing into a, a reactive type of thing. Um, and I think part of me being proactive still, though, when I hosted that um, parent event in last April for news literacy, it was kind of both. It was kind of me saying, here's some things that your student has been doing in school related to news literacy. I'm being very open with you. I'm inviting you in and I'm doing the same things with you so you can see for yourself what we're doing and that it's in the best interest of your child and nothing nefarious is going on. Um, so it's definitely a mix. Well, in creating those opportunities and in, in inviting the families, I imagine is, is far more pleasant a process than responding to um, the, you know, emails and, and, and the questions that you might be getting. And I think there's a great deal of transparency in, in your programming. Yes. If you are including the parents as part of this outreach and in doing so, not just raising the profile of what you do, but also how important you are to the education that their children are receiving in the school. Yes, that's definitely the goal. You know, I understand you you are also a teacher in the English department. I, I, I've got to imagine that having one foot in the classroom and another in the school library, that all of a sudden the challenge of collaborating is that much easier. Yeah, it is in some ways. Um, in some ways, I think, especially at the high school level, that's just going to be an eternal question and an eternal <laughs> struggle. Um, you know, there are some, t and I understand I was a classroom teacher. They think they're too busy or they like what they're teaching and they don't necessarily want to change it. So um, you have to be insanely persistent. Um, and I would consider it a success if you even only work with one teacher. That's better than none. So it's not like, you know, you want to expect yourself to collaborate with every single teacher every year. Um, and I think it really is true. A lot of people say once you get one person in, they will tell everybody else. And I, I mean, that is true. That is true. Um, 
it helps too that I've been on um, a few different book award committees. So, th- you know, that just helps raise your awareness of what's new being published and what's out there and encouraging teachers to do book clubs and read alikes and that kind of stuff. Um, that really helps. And I really, when I came to my new school, this is my third year there, I really tried to focus on first building relationships, not even about books or the library, just as people. Um, and that really does go a long way because they know, okay, she's not a know-it-all. She's not coming in and telling me I'm doing everything wrong. Like she really just, she just really does like books and thinking about things, <laughs> I guess. Um, and also having, um, earning national board certification, I think helps in a way too, um, because you've gone through that process of showing proof of how you've impacted student learning. Um, and those are the kinds of things classroom teachers are also going to maybe care about. Well, and I, I, I credit you because, you know, you're reaching out and building those relationships. Sometimes it's not because you're talking about your library. It's because you're talking about something else and you're able to, to bring yeah. those, those uh, interested teachers into your space and, and a willingness to collaborate because of, of all the things they find att- appealing about you. Maybe it is because you are still a classroom teacher, because you're national board certified. You have so many different uh, things that, that would draw those, those teachers in and, and be interested in working with you. So you have that, that credibility as an educator. You don't have anything to prove. Yes. Yeah. Giving it the spin of I'm, I'm helping you. I'm easing some burdens for you. And like um, when that U.S. history class came in for the station work, I did everything. I said, just give me your standards. If you trust me, I'll make the questions. I'll pull the sources. And she was more than happy to let me do all that. Um, so that made her more likely to want to come in and do it. Be careful what you ask for. You may find yourself incredibly busy uh, working. Well, yes. <laughs> I'm no, glad you absolutely. said that. And, and, and I, uh, I know just in year two, I am, I am already feeling um, a, a lot more uh, popular with some of the teachers who realize that if Amy's teaching, um, then they're, the expectations of what they happen to be doing that class period can be. Uh, redirected and and they're still very much part of the the learning process, but they also have a partner in in what what is happening that day. They have a partner. Yes, yes. The Library Journal article mentioned a few of your programs, and I'm hoping you could share with listeners what your reframing truth and information lesson entailed. Sure. So um, it was the lovely month of October 2020. (laughs) So COVID and election and who knows what else was going on. Um, And I I noticed that, um, you know, I was new to the school at that point, that every month had basically kind of a theme for the advisory program. And so, like I had mentioned earlier, I was just trying to help people. We had this crazy, huge block of time for advisory. And I'm like, hey, I can put something together. I can do a Google Doc. I can do a a Google HyperDoc, stations, whatever you want. Um, And so the the module title, Reframing Truth in Information, I think that's just a fancy way of saying like fake news or something like that. So um, I said, okay, well, I'll put together a Google HyperDoc. Um, kind of like doing virtual station work since, you know, it's COVID and we can't be close to each other. And that way students can just pick whatever they want to do and they just learn a little bit and that's great. That'll be fine. Um, So some of the things that they had the opportunity to look at were differentiating among fake news, misinformation, disinformation, um, what is fabricated content. Maybe the content is just out of context. Maybe it's satire. And there are a lot of really good graphics out there to help students see um, how we want to move away from just the ubiquitous term fake news. Like not everything's fake. It might just be out of context or whatever. So that really helped them understand that a little bit better. So they look at that. um, One of the stations, um, I had links to some of the big social media platforms, misinformation policies. So they actually looked at the policy. So like, what does the policy actually say for Snapchat. And then you can kind of give them an example, like, should this be censored or not? Would Should it be considered misinformation or disinformation or it's just not acceptable or whatever? And yeah, that can get kind of hairy, but, um, you know, you can curate the examples you want them to look at if you're concerned about that or their ages. So they looked at that. Um, one of the stations um, had some links to NPR articles from 2016, 
where reporters found the actual people creating the actual, it was fake news um, about Hillary Clinton. And so you can read the interviews with these people. And yeah, that could be kind of contentious too. Um, But I mean, you know, it shouldn't be because they're the actual people who wrote it telling you why they did it. Um, And not no surprise because they made a lot of money. Um, So they got to look at those articles. um, And so I think it was a great exercise because it was low key. It's not like it was for a grade or anything. They could pick what they wanted to study. um, And it was all stuff that was relevant to them. I love in in our show notes, friends, and I, I, I was so amused. There is a link in our show notes called Spot the Troll online quiz developed by Clemson University F- Media Forensics Hub. And, and <laughs> you know, I don't know if you know anybody at, at Clemson and, and got the inside scoop on this, but that is a clever module. And I, okay. I, I no, I not- don't know anyone at Clemson. I'm a Gamecock. Go Gamecocks. Okay. Okay. <laughs> but but what a fun way for the kids to challenge their, uh, you know, especially because they, they are so convinced that they are media savvy and, and they can yes. spot, they, you know, they know everything and, and, and we don't. And that's fine because I got plenty wrong on spot the troll. I, I, and then the nice thing is once you were playing the game, it gave you an understanding of why this was a troll. What kinds of things would you need to, when we, when we are looking critically at social media, what are some things that would clearly, uh, identify a troll versus, uh, you know, and in this case, uh, you know, somebody who is a, a legitimate, authentic person on social media. So, sure. um, no, I, I love it. And it, I'll tell you, I become better at understanding media when, when you and I have this conversation and all these amazing resources. Jamie, I'm hoping you'll help us out. For listeners who are not familiar with the News Literacy Project, would you please share why this particular resource is so incredibly valuable to school librarians? Oh my gosh, I would not, I don't know what I would do without the News Literacy Project. You can get lost in their website as well. The resources, they have a lesson plan bank and their lesson plans start with upper elementary, grades four through six. Um, So there are opportunities to do this with younger students. Um, they have online quizzes that, that I do often with students as a whole class. We take it together. Um, they have a free weekly newsletter called The Sift that they'll email it to you once a week. And it takes me forever just to look through one newsletter, all of the articles they have. And um, they, they'll give lesson plan ideas in the weekly newsletter. Um, and so it, it, especially if maybe you're wondering, what does journalism have to do with libraries? Um Getting familiar with some of their lesson plans will really make that clear, like how natural of a fit journalism and libraries really do. They, they do go together like that. Um, and so it, it's also a good reminder that it's not political to teach news literacy. We already teach information literacy, which is just what are you lo- what information are you looking for? Do you know how to find it? So now, because of technology and the information landscape has changed so drastically and it's ever evolving, you know, it is within our realm appropriately to help people find information that is reliable, that is safe for them to consume and to share. And I'm, I'm grateful because, again, I started looking at these resources. And you're right. When you say I get lost, it's because you start finding yourself getting drawn into the website. And, and it really is, is so incredibly helpful. You worked with the News Literacy Project, and you've even had a representative come work with your students. And I know listeners would like to know, how were you able to make that happen? Absolutely. They have. Um, so if you don't know the News Literacy Project, they have their own online platform, which is kind of like an online classroom called Checkology. And there are a a lot of different lessons in there that students can have their own login and they could go through the lessons themselves. Or often I'll just put it on my screen and we'll do parts of it together. Um, So through Checkology, they have a newsroom to classroom feature. So I did that um, a couple years ago and they'll pair you up with a local journalist. And so um, I got paired up with an NPR fact checker who had a library degree and it was incredible. Um, And so she actually led my students through a little fact checking exercise and she showed them how she fact checks. That's her job. 
Um, so it was like mind blown. Wow. My worlds came together and I love everything. <laughs> um, so that was incredible. And I, I briefly did a little bit of freelance work with the News Literacy Project a couple years ago when they were just starting to think about creating a framework for teaching news literacy, which actually is out now. And so it's basically like standards with essential questions and indicators and objectives and all that good stuff. So definitely check that out. So I love that in you give the example of in which the students can either work on these modules independently or you can, as, as the instructor in the front of the room, demonstrate how to do this uh, in front of the class. I am fascinated by the lessons you developed around book censorship, and I think it's incredibly timely and still, unfortunately, a grim reality for many school librarians around the country today. Walk us through the Voice of Protest unit. Yes, one of my favorites. Um, this unit was developed by an English teacher who has been uh, a wonderful, wonderful colleague for me, Michael Jett, at my previous school. He's an English teacher. Um, he very much values literacy and collaborated with me all the time. So he had this unit, Voices of Protest, and it gave the students opportunities to understand, like for some of them, Colin Kaepernick, maybe they think he's the only person who's ever protested or something like that. So they, they looked at professional sports throughout history and how protesting or political awareness has been a part of, you know, the, the career, the sports, um, and just different things like that. And even throughout history, especially in America, why the right to protest is even in the First Amendment. Why, why does that make us unique? Um, and so um, I applied for that Judith Krug Band Books Week grant, and I and I won. And so it was a good sum of money, a thousand or fifteen hundred dollars. And I thought about, well, I mean, I could just buy a whole bunch of books, but I don't know if they'll get used. So I went to him and I said, "What? You know, I've got all this money. What do you want to do?" And so we decided that we were going to buy copies for him to have book clubs of books that had recently been challenged in our state, and they were All American Boys, The Hate You Give. Some girls are, um, I'll think of the, the other one. And so I bought all the copies and I eventually also added Dear Martin and The Absolutely True Diary of a Part-Time Indian. And then I even had enough money, we Skyped with Matt De La Pena. Oh, that was the other one, Mexican White Boy. And so they chose the book they wanted and I gave them some introductory activities where they looked at like, what is book censorship? What is the freedom to read? And that kind of stuff for a basis. And then they got to pick the book they wanted to read. And then they just researched why was this a problem in our state? And so that was kind of the, the news literacy component. Um, and as it happened, right when we were, this, this stuff always seems to, <laughs> always seems to happen. Um, Janine Crusette, um, I don't think I'm saying her name correctly. I'm sorry. But um, her, she was visiting Georgia Southern University and some of her students um, were protest. They didn't like some of the things in her book. Shocking. They, they burned her book. And so I was actually able, I think, I don't know if it was on Twitter. I can't remember. Um, I showed them the, the clip that someone took on their cell phone and were sharing around social media. So that was kind of the media literacy component. Like, what does this make you think? What does this make you feel? And we looked at that. Um, and then he even, in one class, had them do a, a staged school board meeting. So that was just really great practice of also thinking about stakeholders. So when you're talking about book censorship, what is a librarian likely to argue? What might a parent be likely to argue? And what is the school board member maybe going to argue? And they can just practice role playing and figuring out those discussions. So really, really rich learning opportunity. I loved it. Well, and considering that these board of education meetings are, are where so many of these sort of uh, viral moments happen and get shared on social media. It is speaking at a board meeting is an opportunity that our students all have, just like community members. What a wonderful opportunity yes. to remind our students that as stakeholders, they are also have the opportunity to speak in front of the the board of education or whatever council that they might be speaking in front of and to do so in a way that is persuasive and in a, to be an opportunity for them to make sure that their voices are heard when decisions are being made that directly affect them. So. Yeah. And that, that reminds me, um, my recent blog posts, I started earlier this year, 
um, relate to Martha Hickson in New Jersey. And so I had become aware of her speaking at that one particular meeting. We were probably all following her story at that point in February, January, February. And so I learned that some of her students had spoken and I said, I would love to interview them. And so she sent me the YouTube link and I watched the parts where some of the students spoke and then I was able to interview some of them. And yeah, putting their stories out there, especially one one student who is on the blog uh, was called Ignorant Youth. And so that person had t-shirts made. <laughs> Um, and I mean, that's, that's why it's so awesome to teach at the high school level because they have the passion, they're in it and they want to do something. Well, and I, I love that again, this is a very empowering lesson. One that will obviously resonate and stay with those students as those young, as those young adults become those, those taxpayers and community members and, and hopefully still very much involved in, in making sure that, that they speak and when they need to at, at these uh, public hearings. My students love learning that we have banned books on our shelves for them to read. And in your case, students are reading books which are banned in other schools in South Carolina. And I'd love to know what kind of feedback they gave you and if you happen to hear from any of your parents. And I understand that you're in an independent school, you're not in a public school, but you know, it really does create opportunities for people to call into question Exactly. What is it the librarian is doing again? Exactly. Um, in that particular unit, I have to point out, was in 2018 when I started that. So <laughs> it wasn't quite as bad back then, the good old days. Um, but no, I think I think maybe one reason why I did not have any parent complaints, um, the students were seniors and they could choose their book. And so we, we said that before we started the unit was, you know, you know yourself, you're going to be an adult. So here are your choices. And if, if there's an issue, come talk to us. But I think because they could choose, that made a difference. And it was very clear every step of the way that I was not telling them what to think. I Every year, I always have, have a student who says about one book, no, that shouldn't be here. And that's fine. I don't tell that student they can't say that. So, you know, they're, they're, when, when you can prove that, you know, that hopefully can help your situation. Um, and I, I have been involved in personal attacks this, this past year. Um, so I have had people contact my school about me, um, but it's never come down to like me having to actually defend myself. And, and I do feel very fortunate. Um, I am very supported at my school, but I think part of that is because I am transparent and I am always inviting them in and they, they just, they know I'm not doing anything wrong. And none of us are, of course, none of us are doing anything wrong. Um, but part of it is having the support in, the, in, in our education efforts. Excellent. As someone who is just starting my second year in high school libraries, I am absolutely in awe of these veteran high school librarians. Would you just tell us what strategies would you offer for those of us who are new to teaching teens? Well, I mean, you have such a great skill set <laughs> with podcasting and all of that. And they love the all in my experience, they, they love that. Um, but I think, you know, and I have been working with teens for 18 years, um, giving them opportunities to do things on their own. So hands on learning is very effective, giving them learning opportunities where they can discuss how they think and how they feel about something is also great because they're just in that developmental stage. Um, so, and that, that lends it so well, itself so well to what we do in the library. Cause it's often not, I have to deliver this content to you. It's, you know, how are you going to find out information? How are you going to figure out how you feel about really important things in your life? And so we help them discover sources of information. And we, sh we try to show them how different people think. And that's what's so bad about censorship, in my opinion, is you're taking away their opportunity just to see how other people think. And that doesn't mean that we're forcing them to think a certain way at all. Um, and that I, I think if we're afraid of that, we're not putting a lot of faith in our children and our students. 
And that's very misplaced. So giving them learning opportunities to discover how they think and feel and uh, discussions that you can kind of guide and rein in um, work well, too, I think. It sounds like when you teach teenagers, you are putting a great deal of trust in them to take some ownership of that learning opportunity um, because some of it is self-directed and it gives them an opportunity to form their own opinions about how they feel about the information that you are sharing with them as these sort of young adults with training wheels. They're brand new. They're, they're, they're going to be adults very soon. It is absolutely essential that they start thinking and, and making decisions that are, that work for them. I will be honest as somebody who has worked in, in elementary for the past 14 years, I feel like I need to remember what it's like to teach teenagers. Sure. Yeah. I mean, they can be brutal. They can be brutal. You just have to keep going. You're like, I don't know why you don't think this is cool to learn about whatever. I, you just keep going, you know, (laughs) When the more we incorporate media and things that they might are likely to see, and I think the more relevant it can be and using those visuals, because uh, my students are are convinced that all they need is, is that phone in their hands and, and they can, uh, they have everything they need to, to know going forward. And, and I love that when you're teaching them media awareness and you're teaching them these skills that they are becoming more savvy as consumers. And as they are taking in the things that they see, they are forming opinions and, and making decisions about what to trust and what not to trust and to encourage them to be skeptical about all the things that are coming across their feeds because, uh, you know, they are as consumers of social media being bombarded with a lot of the information and misinformation and, and, and fake news. And, and we are helping them become smarter and more savvy in, in how they take that all in. Yeah, I can give you an example of that. We last fall when the Mark Zuckerberg Instagram story hit, um, I thought, oh, this is a perfect opportunity. We're going to talk about this. And so I made another hyperdoc of some station work. Um, actually, that was for when I was at AASL in Salt Lake City. <laughs> so it was great. Uh, but I, I asked them at one point, they had, they had to find a straight news article about the story. They had to find an opinion piece about it. And then another opinion piece that was a different opinion from the other one they shared. This was all on a shared Google Doc. And then I asked them to find a meme about it. And I don't know if this is surprising or not, but they really struggled with that. Um, they found a lot of like silly stuff making fun of Mark Zuckerberg, but I was trying to get them to find user generated content that was posing as news, but was really just someone's opinion that they were typing and sharing that, you know, people share, you know, and then they say, can you believe this or whatever? And it's not even real or true or whatever. Um, They really struggled with that. So it was interesting for them, you know, like you said earlier, they do think highly of their own skills. Uh, Most people do. But then when I'm asking for, okay, find me a piece of user generated content about this topic, they really struggled. So that was a really interesting uh, exercise. I love that you keep them keep them uh, uh, on the edge of their seat. They really, at this point, you're putting the expectation of of that discovery in in their hands, and they're they're going to be the ones that that make those those discoveries for themselves. I I know that uh, I'm sure there are listeners out there who would greatly appreciate if you wanted to ever include a sample of of something that you might put in front of students. Um, that would be greatly appreciated. I will, yeah, for sure. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Jamie Gregory, would you please let us know how we can follow you on social media? Because I, I always learn from you when I see things that you post. And I, I've i already got so many great ideas. And I'm so grateful that you came to share with us today. Let us know how we can follow you. Sure. I'm on Twitter at Gregor, G-R-E-G-O-R-J-M. Um, I am private right now because of all the fun I've been having with my new friends. Uh, that's sarcasm. <laughs> so I, I will definitely uh, accept you and follow you back, but just know that it is private right now. 
No, and and we talked about this in the social media, uh, the the hashtag library Twitter uh, episode. That especially right now, if you happen to have caught the attention of individuals who feel that you are somebody who are you know intentionally jeopardizing the education of our youth. Um, it is in your best interest to be guarded about who you encounter on social media. And, and I, I respect that because it is what we do has caught the attention of, of plenty of individuals who unfortunately feel that we are not necessarily working in the best interest of our students. Yeah, it's and I mean, you have done so much to promote awareness of how what so many of us are doing. And, you know, you can't be a librarian only one way. And that's part of why I love the profession so much. Um, And it's great to see all the different award winners, because we're all doing different things. You find things you're passionate about or that you're good at. um, And you're just promoting so many voices. um, And it's really helping, I think, with the morale of the profession right now. Well, I will, and I, I've made this promise before, I will never run out of content because <laughs> I will never run out of amazing school librarians who not only do fantastic things in their schools, they're also willing to share those with listeners around the country and around the world because when we when we when we raise the profile of our profession in the in the school community we support, we are helping other school librarians do the same in their school communities. So Jamie Gregory, thank you so much for joining us tonight. And I wish you a fantastic school year. Thank you. You too. I'm so honored. Thank you for all you do. Friends, I firmly believe that librarians make the best curators, and you're going to agree with me when you see Jamie Gregory's resources in our show notes. Make time and don't miss them if you are ever looking for fantastic ways to inspire media awareness in your students. If you found this episode helpful, please share it out with your team, your PLN, and on social media. Be sure to follow on your favorite podcatcher so you'll never miss an episode. And if you really like listening today, consider leaving Jamie some fan mail on social media. I know that she'd love to hear from you. One last friendly reminder, friends, I encourage you to take advantage of Capstone's generous $20 discount off an order of $100 or more using the code UNITED. The topic of our next episode will be weeding expert and my conversation with Rebecca Vanuk. I hope you will tune in.